Well, if you would, please take your Bibles and turn to Malachi. Um, if you need help, just go to Matthew and go to the left about three pages, and you'll be at the beginning of Malachi. As the Lord has seen fit uh, by His grace before uh, we finish our uh, packing and begin our transition, we will have the privilege, Lord willing, to finish all of the minor prophets um, here in the next couple of weeks after today. So I'm thankful for that. I'm very thankful for that. I love the minor prophets. I love what it does to us. I love the questions that it both provokes and answers. Um, you know, and I do like it that we're, you know, such an edgy church that we preach through things that uh, most people don't. So, you know, we should take not pride in that because that would be weird. But anyway, uh, nonetheless, I'm, I'm thankful. Thanks for listening. Not as if you had much of a choice. Malachi, what is Malachi about? Well, his name means messenger. So now all of them have been messengers. All of the minor prophets have been messengers. They have brought the word of the Lord. In fact, prophet by nature, a minor prophet, uh, especially as they were tasked with very, very specific time frames, very specific prophecies, they have been considered these messengers who are really literally to get out of the way and say, thus saith the Lord. I mean, even as Renee said, this is the word of the Lord. And then it becomes something else. Because the word of the Lord is something that must stand on its own. It's one of the difficulties of preaching is that as much as we are trying to ex explicate simply what the word of God says, um, too often we do uh, mix and mingle our personalities and other things into the text. That shouldn't be. We do have to avoid that. At the same time, God does use our humanity. And so in the course of it, then we are able to articulate some things without reading into the text. Simply let the Word of God come through. It does come through human personality, just as it did when it was originally written. But our aim and our battle and our struggle is simply this, to make sure that for our particular context, that the Word of God is understood as the original context, understood it at least by message. Uh, we don't live in that context. So it'd be hard enough if you were living in the same exact context in the Middle East, in Jerusalem, with a dilapidated or broken down temple, and it just having been rebuilt and still waiting on the Messianic kingdom to actually be not just inaugurated, but actually completed, and there be a Messiah of God sitting on the throne. Even if you were sitting in the actual physical place, it would be hard. You, it would be hard to actually feel all that was supposed to be felt at the time by the original hearers to these messages. And here we are in the West. Here we are as we look on our news feeds online, uh, perhaps in different media outlets of continual war and battle that's going on in the Middle East even now. But with that, we trust that what God had for the original hearers, he has for us. This is one of the commitments of what we call expository preaching, that we just simply desire for the original text and meaning, the original authorial intent, that that would carry over to today. But we also have this understanding that we are not simply on that side of the cross or the empty tomb. So in a real sense, this is kind of peeling back the curtain a little bit in sermon preparation. In, the, in a real sense, you study very hard for the original text and context. But then you also have to see where it connects with Christ because all of the text does. All of the text finds its yes in Jesus Christ and everything that he has accomplished on behalf of his own. So it has to inform the text even pre-Messianic. But even then, we still have to do some more work because we have to put it into our particular context so that we know rightly how to apply it today. So basically, it's not something you just come to casually. It's something that you, as you come to it, you trust that God has something for us here, and let's trust what that is. So with Malachi being the messenger, he was most likely a contemporary of Ezra and Nehemiah. And again, those two books are ones that, as the Old Testament was kind of reassembled um, in a way other than the way it was for Old Testament readers, um, it's a little unfortunate that we have Ezra and Nehemiah where it is because they were post-Haggai, post-Zechariah. 
So here you have, uh, it's probably anywhere from 60 to 80 years later than those two guys, the Ezra and Nehemiah bunch, as well as Malachi. And you have the same pattern going on that we've seen before, which is this, especially post-exilic, which would be post-Cyrus and Assyria and him letting the people of God go back as Isaiah had prophesied. So as they went back, they started to build the temple. They didn't finish it. They grew weary. Haggai charges them, hey, you didn't finish the job. You're working on your own houses. And then they go back to it. They do finish it as a result of his charge. And then sure enough, in finishing it, they have hopes that the kingdom is going to be established by the Messiah. And they're going to be kind of winners again. Well, that goes on for a period of time. Doesn't happen. They start to mix and mingle. They grow weary of living by faith. So they start living by sight. And they start to bring in the practices of different countries that they've been imprisoned by, held captive by, they start to veer into those earthly practices, disobeying God, not being faithful to what he'd called them to do. Well, so then again, you have another charge of here you are. Zechariah comes in and says, look, you finished everything, but you, your hearts are far away. You are far from the Lord. You, your, your priests are off. And really Malachi very much echoes what we hear in Zechariah, except a solid generation later. They were still waiting. They had been charged to get some things right. They, they did for a period after Zechariah, but then all of a sudden they grow weary again and they start to mix and mingle and they start to really get off in their worship practices and in their civil practices. And Malachi comes in with this oracle. And really what you have in this book is you have this, this oracle or this sermon has basically six points or as a lot of the commentaries or, or com, uh, commentators would say, uh, disputes or dispen, uh, disputations. So basically you have six points to the main sermon that Malachi is giving here. What we're going to do this morning is deal with really just the first one. And that's just in the first five verses. But in doing so, which it's like a, it's like a deep breath for me to not have to preach a couple of chapters, that feels good. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be shorter, but it, it at least uh, allows for us to uh, sink our teeth a little bit into this book and chew on these early stages of this book to understand it better in these next couple of weeks. And so he is saying, as they have grown weary again of having to live by faith and not live by sight, not live by a ruling kingdom, he starts to charge them again with, they are off in their perspective of what it means to worship God. They're not seeing God rightly. Now, it does go on because they, they end up, as they always did, they ended up messing up marriage. They were divorcing for no good reason, as if there are really like good reasons, but there were some mosaic concessions. They weren't even acknowledging those. They were just divorcing left and right, and they were intermarrying, which the, the charge there is not because you can't marry other ethnicities. It, anybody that uses that is not just doing gymnastics with the text. They are actually being racist and leveraging the text as a weapon for their own racism. That is not what God says. It's because they are adopting and adapting to the worship practices of false worshiping kingdoms and nations, which God said not to. It, 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 as I look at this, it's impossible for me not to remember an account in a church that I went to where the, the largest donor to the church, the largest giver of the church, had long since been married, um, but had not divorced that woman, but was living for a solid 20 years with a woman that was not his wife. And I remember one of the deacons came to me at one point and said, hey, just so you know, so-and-so, man, he's a great guy. He just happens to be bad at marriage. And I'm going, I don't think you get to do that. I don't think that's how this works. I don't think you get to say you're this, but then let's parse that out, and, but you're not great at that. In fact, as we look at Malachi, which is all about worship, I think it's very clear to say you cannot have your marriage in complete disarray or have a wrong view of marriage or have a wrong view of those interpersonal relationships that image God and be one who worships rightly. I don't care how much you give. In fact, I would say that whatever you're giving, you're probably doing that to assuage your own guilt. Don't give. If you can't give from a cheerful, worship-filled heart, and I don't want the finance committee to get nervous, but please, for your own soul's sake, do not give. We are worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. And so, yes, Malachi does deal with marriage and divorce. It deals with offerings. It deals with tithing. It deals overall with this perspective of what it means to be a true worshiper of God. 
You say, well, okay, I'm glad you're able to finish the Minor Prophets, but how does that fit with Missions Conference? Well, by God's grace, um, one of the tenets that the Lord began to work in me back in 96 to 99, I was missions pastor at a church in North Texas and got very involved in North Vietnam at the time. And uh, we, we had a, a really incredible reach. We even, I, I even literally sat in what was a, a prior French Catholic church north of Hanoi that was now a communist precinct headquarters and sat with those leaders as they gave our church land to build a preschool um, in that region, knowing that we were Christian. We still had to be careful, though, because we also had relationships with a lot of people in the underground church that would regularly be arrested. But in the course of it, seeing the world in a fresh way, it really became clear to me in the course that there was this connection. And by God's grace, he also gave this incredible statement to a pastor that a lot of you know, John Piper. Um, all of this came real to me all at one time. What Piper said, and I'll tell it to you in a minute, but also where I was in my ministry work and life and also this involvement in North Vietnam. But Piper says this, he says, missions exists because worship doesn't. Missions exist because worship doesn't. See, the thing is, we have a God that is worth our worship. We don't serve, as we've said many times, he is not a Greek God, as in he is precarious. He is, his emotions rise and fall on the worship and prayers of his people, how much they need him. That is not our God. Our Trinitarian God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, did not need humanity to complete himself. I don't know what you grew up hearing, but God was not lonely. He did not need fellowship. He is perfectly content and happy within himself. But God did see fit that his glory would be most beautifully seen in the cosmos that he made through this thing called redemption. And in doing so, he created people that would be redeemed, which also meant that he would end up allowing some kind of antagonism against his redemption so that he could redeem them from something. In, 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 in those earliest kind of very ontological questions about the existence of man and the creation of the world, and the creation of the cosmos, it still boils down for us simply this. God is worthy of worship. And the reason that we do missions is because God has not come back yet to finish the throng, the number of those who will be worshipers. And he's just simply bringing in more that will be worshipers. But here's where it hits for us. We are not just donors to a mission that's out there. We are not just those that fund with both our money, but also kind of fund through our praying, the mission that's going on out there. That is completely against what scripture would say. I've told you many times, Paul in his push for evangelism, his push for evangelistic praying was always this, God, make your people more Christian. If you want us to be more missional, if you want us as Christians and as a church to be more on mission and more rightly on mission, even here locally, the best thing you can do is to rightly understand what it means to be a worshiper of God. If we parse out what it means to be worshipers and what it means to be evangelists, then I promise you we are seeing it as transactional. We're seeing it as something we are responsible to do and accomplish. And if we don't see all the results, anything that's transactional is, there's a large temptation to be pragmatic oh, this ministry isn't really reaching that much. Maybe we should pull funding from them. Or if we're not really doing this, even though, you know, we've done some prayer walking or maybe door to door, but because we're not seeing a lot of results, maybe we should do something else. In the, in the most basic of senses, how is that any different than the children of Israel growing weary of having to live by faith instead of by sight and to cease doing well? In Malachi, right at the beginning in chapter one, he says this, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. It's the, it's the best salutation in all of scripture. It's so clear. It's so straightforward. It's, it's exactly how my wife wishes that I would speak every day. Just so simple, so straightforward. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste to, the hill, to his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may, be, they may rebuild, or they may build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country. 
and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. So it's interesting because even in this very first point of this larger message of this entire book of Malachi, in this first dispute, as he comes against them to basically say that they are presenting themselves and having a wrong view of God, which is this is where all this begins. Missions and worship both begins with the right view of God. But it's interesting because by the very end, in verse, even in verse 5, you don't have to go to the end of the book to have the spoiler. He even says, your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. So where God is having for himself a people that are being preserved, a remnant that are being kept, that are called to be holy, it resonates, it ripples the glory of God to the surrounding world. This is as missions should be. The church of the living God, and please don't overly American centralize this idea. We have missionaries coming here from other countries, okay? This is not because America is not the savior of the known world, not spiritually and not in any other way. The fact is God is sovereign and good, and he has used us, and I pray that he would use us better than he has in the last probably 10 years, not his use, but maybe that men would respond so that we would again be those who are strong allies and supporters for people across the world, which I think we're often seeing that even now. But the fact is, is that we understand that spiritually speaking, It is the worshipers of the Lord Jesus Christ that causes ripples to go out all over the world. And this is also one reason why we strongly pray that God would raise up indigenous peoples. It's not just us going, and nor should it ever be us going, and in effect kind of colonizing not so much what church looks like, but even what the gospel sounds like. And here's what I mean. So for instance, in one of the poorest regions in the entire world, in a part of Central Africa, It's also one of the places that actually has the highest amount of growth for the prosperity gospel. How in the world does that make sense? And yet it does. It's just that what they consider to be prosperity, more water, food, perhaps healing from some disease, is far a cry from what we hear in the West. More cars, bigger houses, better jobs, you know, younger wives, so I can keep doing the mission as some pastors have claimed as they've traded in their old ones for younger ones. The fact is, is that that is never, ever a right view of God and therefore worship is prostituted and missions is convoluted at best, if not completely heretical. What God shows us with Malachi is what you win them to, what you win them with, how you win the people is really what they're converting to. Means will matter. How you give, how you think, how you pray, how you serve, all of that matters in the worship of God and therefore the right view of missions in the world. In this book, we have 43% of the use of Lord of Hosts is used uh, as far as like the percentage of words that use Lord of Hosts. It actually has like 43, 44% of the words in Malachi Um, has the use of Lord of hosts is this phrase. It's higher than any other book in all of scripture, which is interesting because when you think about this book being about worship and that also then that phrase is the chosen phrase to be the descriptor of God by Malachi to the people. It helps you get an understanding that yes, this view of God is the most important initial factor in worshiping rightly. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the sovereign Lord of all of the hosts. And those hosts would include celestial beings like angels, demons, and certainly created beings like humanity. And it's not restricted to a particular nation or type. It says that he is Lord of all. And Malachi is so focused on this understanding of God being sovereign and Lord of all that if you don't see, if we don't see God rightly as the one who lives and rules and reigns and is creator over all, then we will not do missions rightly and we will not worship accurately. And this isn't about some kind of stiff accuracy. It's about a, an interaction and a humility before the Lord of hosts to help us understand. Our God loves because he loves. He doesn't love based on the merits of anyone. 
He doesn't love any group because he has to. He loves simply because he has chosen to. And the fact is, regardless of how it may hit us, God can choose to choose someone, choose to love others, and not to choose and choose to love others as he sees fit for his glory. We can argue about that all day long, but it doesn't change the cosmic understanding that God is sovereign and does as he wills. Now that may seem unfair to some of you, but then you have to deal with the idea of fairness, which is this idea. There's none righteous, no, not one. To whom does God owe fairness? The fact that God shows his love to any, even if God only showed his love to 10 over the 5,000 or 5 million years the world's existed, you know, depending on how you value it. But whatever you see, even if it's only 10 people, they should write hymn book after hymn book after hymn book of the praise and the grace and the glory of God. Because we don't deserve to be saved. Anytime we start to struggle with God's view or our view of God being a fair God, we immediately enter into a misunderstanding of what it means for him to be Lord of hosts and for us to be an unrighteous lot by nature. Worship matters in a right view of God. We have to view God rightly so because how we worship him matters because God says it does throughout this entire book. How we worship him matters because by and large, we don't understand worship as we ought to. I received one of the greatest compliments I've ever received in the last couple of weeks um, from someone that I love very much. She said, I think you would do well in the Jamaican church. It made me feel great um, because they have really long services. And that wasn't like a jab because I preached really long that day, I promise you. Um, but as, as she was being so uh, vocal in her uh, commendation, it just, um, I, I loved what she was saying. Um, and and <laughs> because it, it helped me understand that there are so many others that view worship in a completely different way than so many of us do here in the West. We block out an hour. We block out an hour and 15, hour and 20 maybe. Maybe if you're elite status, you stay for Sunday school. And then maybe if you're really super elite varsity level, you might do some missions, go on a mission trip, or be involved in some other leadership. And I know that I'm not, I don't mean that against anyone that's involved in those things. I mean, just that's in general how so many think. It's almost like as if we just simply give God the due that we think that we should, instead of it being worship. Lord of hosts, unrighteous, undeserving of his love, his affection, or his attention. This is never about paying God back. If you could not pay him forward for redemption, you can't pay him back for what he's done. And Malachi makes this clear. It's all rooted and based in the loving, sovereign choice of God. And that's what we have here is not just understanding a right view of God, but understanding a right view of God's love, which is really the bulk of verses two through four. Now, as you know this passage, or at least if you've studied anywhere in the New Testament, especially in Romans, you know that this is quoted over in the very precarious and difficult uh, section of Scripture of Romans 9 through 11, which we're not going to unpack the whole thing, but it is important, I think, for us to understand some of the nature of it. To understand God's love and who He is, which is central to our understanding of right worship and therefore right mission, we must understand that God's love is expressed in the gracious and sovereign election of some, not all. But let me say this at the onset, because I've actually heard preachers of mega churches say, if you hold to anything that's close to this kind of doctrine, that means the preacher has to say, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you, but he doesn't love you. And in fact, I even heard one preacher that I ended up writing uh, and telling him and rebuking him, whether or not he read it, because his church is like 20,000 people, so I'm guessing not, but, um, but he said it at a VBS service in front of children. I'm going, anybody that acknowledges God's sovereignty in his elective work, in his loving, gracious, sovereign work, nobody I know or have ever studied would ever say that man is led in on that information. This is simply God's side of the deal because what God has said is he has called us to put our feet on every soil on the face of the earth and proclaim and share the glory, glorious good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when he does save some, 
It is to his glory and to his credit, not because you sucked it up and you went overseas and got in some really hard places. I'm glad that we do these things, but it's because of God's glorious work that he gets all the praise, not just for the grace that's given, but for the faith even that's received. We are instruments. We are, again, we are expendable to be used as God sees fit. He doesn't need any one of us in any one place. He will take care of his church and he will advance his kingdom and he will continue to save those that he desires to save. And the fact that he chooses to allow us to be part of this process of declaring the word of God so that that word of God gives birth to faith, it is an incredibly humbling and should be worship-filled event. Evangelism and mission should be an expression of worship. I'm living out the sovereign God's initiative and work simply by opening my mouth. And if they don't respond, it should break my heart. But at the same time, you know what I do? It does trouble me, but I can still sleep at some point in the night because I still trust that, look, God still may work in their lives at some point. The seed has been planted. Open more doors, Lord, if you will. The fact that someone does not share Christ is not because of theology. If someone doesn't share Christ and is not involved in mission, it's because they are disobedient and do not see the Lord of hosts as they should. Disobedience is always the reason we do not share the gospel. It's always the reason. He loves us because he loves. He says, the Lord says, I have loved you. And then he says, okay, well, you say, how have you loved us? He is not Esau, Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Now in that he's making very clear that it is God's love and expression of love that simply, because even if you read into Romans in the text, and we'll get there in just a second, it says before they'd even done a thing. It's not based on work. And don't brush it under the rug of foreknowledge. It's not because God looked into the future and knew what they were going to do and he chose them in the past. Time travel movies don't even work that way. That's just not how it works. Because God is infinite. Therefore, God is not bound by space or time. If you really want to have your mind blown, that means that if there is a future, God's not looking into it. He's there. If there's a past, he's not looking into it. that, That is such a finite creature's view of an infinite God. He is infinite. He is sovereign over all. And the fact that he chooses to love any at all is an incredibly gracious, awesome work of mercy. Jacob and his line, and really this idea of love and hated is more about choice. It's more about rejection and receiving rather than kind of the affection, so to speak. Because certainly along the way, even though Esau's line is not the one that he works through, There are some along the way that do become worshipers. Jacob in general, his line, even though he was a deceiver in many ways, his is accepted because God chose for it to work out this way. Just as God initially chose Abram, who by nature wasn't a Jew. The Jewish nation was birthed out of that. So it wasn't in response to, oh, I'm just going to really love the Jews. He made a choice, established the Jewish nation to help us understand better the idea of the law, the idea of grace, the idea of our inability to keep our end of the covenant bargain, and also to point to the Messiah who would then bring in others who would become, as Paul would say, the spiritual nation of Israel, the church. Esau and his line were rejected, but it wasn't because of animosity. They had not done a thing yet, at least in time. But this election was not based on what he did or would do. It was simply based on God made a choice and it would have been gracious for him to choose anyone. And he would have been just and right to reject everyone. It's never about justice as to why God doesn't save more. It would always be just if God did condemn and damn all. I know this sounds mean, but that's not the point. I am being stark. Okay, I'm not trying to to smooth out some of the edges. I'm simply saying that we have to understand that to see worship and be worshipers who rightly are on mission as worshipers, we must see that he is the Lord who is sovereign over all of the hosts, celestial and created otherwise. And this love then is vindicated, so to speak. As he says in verse 2, 
that yet I have loved Jacob. And then he goes on, but, I, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. And he says, if Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. What does the Lord say? He says, they may build, but I will tear down. So no matter how much they may try to become God's chosen, it ain't going to happen God is going to vindicate his own choice by the redemption of some in the line that he has made for himself, Jacob's line. Now, we do have to go over to Romans. So I do want you to flip over to Romans chapter 9. And we're going to look at verses 8 through 16. Now, just to give you a really quick view here, Romans 9 through 11 is Paul speaking to first. Um, Jews and then Gentiles in speaking of God's sovereign work and how God is working among the Gentiles and hopefully that that is bringing about a jealousy among the Jews so to speak but also it's helping to bring a right understanding of what it means to be part of the redemptive community overall because he speaks about the 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 dividing wall breaking down between the two uh, ethnicities or the two people groups of Jew and Gentile which is all the other nations and in 9 through 11 he would basically say well here's what I've done And here's what I did among my people, the Jews. And now I'm focusing my attention on Gentiles. But then in chapter 10, he starts to say basically, now Gentiles don't get prideful about this because it's still this mystery. Here's the mystery. The mystery is Gentiles can be part of everything I've ever talked about with the promises made to my people, the Jews. Now the Gentiles can be grafted in, but it's through faith. It's not by justification of the law. It's through faith. And the Gentiles can enter in also into that promised land, that promised covenant that God made through Abraham. But it's also a mystery to the Jews because the mystery of the Jews is, and we saw this throughout the minor prophets, they had a misunderstanding of what it meant to be God's chosen people. They thought they were good no matter what they did. And God had always said, nope, it's always been about keeping the covenant. All the way back in Amos chapter 3, that's what happened. Everybody was cool with Amos while he was saying God was going to judge all these other nations until in Amos 3, he says, he's also going to judge some of you on the same standard. They're like, wait a minute, let's kill Amos because we don't like what he's saying. The fact is God's standard of holiness is good for all. The mystery to the Jews of the New Testament is they're not automatically entered in just by their ethnicity. They also have to come in by faith. So the fact that the Gentile even had access was a mystery and it was great news. To the Jew, it was clarifying news that has always been the truth. The minor prophets prove this has always been the interpretive truth of the Old Testament covenant. That it was never just for ethnic Jew. It was for covenant keeping Jew. And the covenant by nature as it was given the law proved that don't covet, oops, I'm a coveter. And Paul said this in chapter 7 of Romans. So that means I'm dying. That means I'm no good. Paul the Jew. The law says, here is sin. I realize I'm a sinner. It points out that Jew and Gentile alike, Gentile never even thought they had a chance, but Jew alike says, I cannot enter in if I'm I'm a breaker of the law. All pointing to the fact that Jesus the Christ is the only covenant keeper. And it's faith in Christ as the covenant keeper for the Jew and faith in Christ that Christ accomplished this on behalf of even the Gentile that both can enter in. And Paul is kind of unpacking this in 9 through 11, but he's doing it initially by showing that God is sovereign as the Lord of hosts over all of humanity. And so as he's he's first dealing with the Jew in chapter 9, you look at verse 8 and he says, this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also uh, when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had not done and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue not because of works but because of him who calls again this is about that right view of worship this is why he's quoting Malachi it requires you to understand the nature of God and the nature of God's love it is by gracious election it's not on merit a person that sees this rightly and worships like this you know what they do they don't have an ethnic bias when they go anywhere in the world to witness. 
They don't sneer at the fact that God's calling them to witness in a Muslim country. Ah, oh, they're Muslims though. This removes that. It should embolden our mission. He says, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now, if we go on, he says, what should we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So, I mean, this is a really heavy truth. And there have been some along the way who have tried to do, again, different kind of exegetical gymnastics with the text to say, well, what, what Paul's saying here about God really isn't, that's not really what he's saying. And the simplest truth is, no matter what good, decent, half-decent translation you have, it sounds like this. But again, this is God's end of the deal. This is not secret knowledge that we enter into. We don't know who God has seen fit that by the end he will save and whom he will not save. But what we do say is that when God saves, it is God that saves. It's not that person that saved themselves by exertion or by believing the right stuff. And it's not theirs to be saved because I went and I did this, I did that. He will get all of the glory for everything related to the salvation of men. His love has to do with simply his desire and his will to show forth his plan of grace and mercy and election that many indeed will be saved, but it's not all. This is an offering that is universal, but it's not something that is universalism. He doesn't save everyone. But it does mean that anyone, if God has seen fit, can be saved. Therefore, our mission must be worldwide. We could never and should never say that God has determined that some will receive him and some won't. In any part of the world, for any reason, as vile as it is that the country of Iran is doing what they're doing, and I do pray for justice to be entered in, that should not cause us to pray less for Iranians to become Christians. Or Iraqis, or Jews, or those in the Gazan Strip. Or Hispanics, or blacks, or Asians, or anyone else. The offering of salvation is universal because when they do come, it is an exposure of God's gracious mercy to whom he sees fit. And if you have been brought in, then please understand it's not because of grandma. It's not because of your parents. It's not because of any other heritage or reason. Yes, God sometimes sees fit that in his election, he does let some of us be born into Christian families, but some of you are not. And because of that, we get weird. We think, oh, I grew up in a Christian family, so therefore I don't have the really exciting testimony of drugs and all this kind of stuff, although plenty of Christian family kids do drugs and stuff like that, but um, not mine. <laughs> but, um, but the fact is, is that God does allow that because here's what we have to understand and here's what the, I hope the right preaching of God's word over time does. Dead is dead. A corpse is a corpse. At some point, apart from doing autopsies, the cause of death Besides for the fact of some kind of earthly justice, it doesn't matter to that person. They are dead. And that is what Scripture says of us spiritually. Jew, Gentile, anyone alike on any part of the face of the planet. And for us to understand that God is the Lord of hosts, that when he cries out, Lazarus, come forth, or Tim, come forth, or Mike, come forth, or Rich, come forth. He is saying and calling us out of whether Jew or Gentile or anyone alike, we are coming out of a spiritual tomb. And we must see to be right worshipers that he is the Lord of hosts. And as he rose from the dead himself, as we celebrated a couple of weeks ago, he himself calls others to, ra to be raised from the spiritual dead and will give them new and eternal life. And only he can utter that word. And the fact is he chooses to do it through us. Which Paul calls the foolish exchange. 
that we can say words that seem dumb to the world, but God actually uses them to give eternal life. That's a foolish exchange. But it's the same exchange that Jesus said when he said, Lazarus, come forth. Words? Reanimation? It's like magic. That's the power of the gospel proclaimed. As we see his love expressed in this way, we understand that God's rejection of sin and sinners must be in concert also with his character and his work. So when he chooses some that will be saved, as we see that he is sovereign to do so, that he is already, as 9 through 11 actually unpacks, that God's purpose in the election of some actually works itself out through his plan continually played out through Christ accomplishing everything necessary because no one's just in because they're in. They have to be redeemed. They have to be brought to life and redeemed through Christ, the covenant keeper. So as a result then, there's other passages we could go to, but basically as a result, we see that verse 5 says, if you understand rightly that this God is the God of the, of the Lord of hosts, that he loves because he loves and he chooses to love, and it's not unjust if he doesn't choose everyone, that no matter what the efforts may be of some to try to make for themselves a God-like experience in this world, God will frustrate those efforts and God will be the only one who will be the God of praise as a result of redemption. That people who rightly understand that and worship with that perspective, that he's the Lord who's over all and he saves those who he will save. And if we are, it is a mercy and it's not an injustice. Then we will then understand verse five better. Our eyes will see that God's glory will go out among the nations far beyond the borders of Israel or the church. Because the fact is, when God again says, come forth to anyone, anywhere, he can do it. And that's the pleasure that we get in being worshipers who also are on mission. They go together. In fact, I would say this, and I've, I've shared this with you before, but this idea of reverse engineering um, to understand kind of where you are spiritually, I would ask yourself kind of this. If you feel like you're faithful in worship and have a right view of worshiping God, how is your evangelism? It's, it's, not a, it's truly, truly not a guilt thing. I mean, I'll ask the same thing about giving and tithing and stuff like that, and that may feel that way too. But anyway, but right now we're just dealing with if, if you think that you have a right view of worship and faithful worship, how is your gospel sharing? How is your missional mindset? But on the other hand, if you think about missions and if you think that you're thoughtful about missions and other things, how do you pray? And how do you respond to things like, if you're praying about missions and evangelism, are you always praying that God would send someone else? Or is your view of God so enrapturing of who you are that you're praying that God would give you opportunity? you're looking for opportunity to share. That you understand that it's not about just pulling yourself up by your own missional bootstraps and doing better, that it actually is about being more enamored with the God who is the Lord of hosts. These things go together. The church that understands worship well, sees God rightly, will be on mission and they will look for opportunities to be on mission. And I would say this, that if a church looks very active in mission and yet they are not preaching rightly, then I would say whatever their, whatever their mission is, it is not the gospel. And that can fool us sometimes. But really it ends up just being a benevolent or social driven kind of work, merely. But I'll say this, in, in, in that vein is simply this, that if we view God rightly as the sovereign over all, and you know what? We're even willing to do the social stuff, the mercy stuff, the cleaning up riverbed systems and, and other things that we can do to bless our community just for the opportunity to be able to walk into an office that we just helped with somebody and say, hey, would you like to come to Easter service? Or can I talk to you about this or talk to you about that? We are willing to do that stuff that we know doesn't save in the end, even if it just gives us an opportunity to speak of the things that could save in the end. We don't cheapen any act of mercy any more than as we look at our own testimonies to think that it was 
lesser that God did this or God did that in the process of graciously and mercifully drawing us to himself. A right view of worship leads to a right view of mission. And it begins with seeing God as the Lord of hosts and as the Lord of hosts, the God who in his love elects and saves those that he will save. And it is always an act of mercy and he's never unjust. When you embrace that God, humbly come before him, I promise you your mission will increase. God, I pray that you'd help us today to to see Malachi for what it is and to see Paul and his use of this text for what it is. A reminder that it is not on any merit that anyone is saved. It is not based on any other metric apart from you as the Lord of hosts, the Lord of all creation, have chosen to love and to complete your plan of redemption so that all those who do come to you by your own sovereign grace that they have been pardoned, that their redemption has been purchased. That it was not merely a way that you made, even though you are the way, you actually did purchase redemption, particularly so on the cross. And Lord, in doing so, you get all the praise for anyone that ever from any place comes to faith in Christ. So God, help us to see you rightly. And I pray that we would see the fruit of that being that we see with our own eyes the nations and we see your glory and your greatness go out among those nations because we're seeing you from a right set of eyes, maybe for the first time. So God, as, as hard a truth as some of this is, I pray that you would just remind everyone in the room that I mean, you're God and we're not. That we cannot put humanity's restrictions as finite beings onto the infinite divine. So Lord, forgive us for when we have. Because to even utter or even think that, oh, well, you certainly can't be this way because we can't fathom it as humans, is to immediately begin to recreate you into our own image. Forgive us for the times that we've done that, Lord. And I pray that you would help us to understand that this leaves us with questions. But God forbid we ever be a church or have a pulpit that would ever proclaim things that always make sense. Your thoughts are not ours. Your ways are not ours. But the fact that you include us in some of those ways is a mercy that is worth going to the hardest places on the planet and even dying for, even if we don't see the results in the moment as many have throughout the generations, just to simply know we had an opportunity to tell of your greatness. Be glorified even now in and through us, Lord. Amen.